What if you could help others to find the power to heal themselves, physically, emotionally, and spiritually? When I started teaching my classes, it was in 2002, and I was just doing the past life regressions and contacting the subconscious part. But then as the time went on and we found how powerful this was and what we could do with it, a lot of the students began saying, you know, advanced past life regression doesn't really tell what it's all about. This is so much more than that. We think you should change the name. So it was a few years ago, we decided to change the name to Quantum Healing Hypnosis Technique. And this is the healing technique that we've now been teaching it, well, since 2002, that's 12 years. What if you could time travel with them? Visit mythical places or angelic realms, other worlds, other galaxies. Help others to speak to their higher selves. You can. Dolores has taught thousands of people from across the world how to use QHHT and now you can learn her method by going directly to DoloresCannon.com and don't forget to mention the discount code MORETALKS. So I guess everybody got their supper now. Okay, and Nancy had her plane delayed and everything yesterday, but she got in here last night. So I was worrying about her, but she's here. I'm taking lessons from you. <laughs> Nancy Talbert and I also go back many years. Everybody I have at these things I've known for many years. <laughs> but we, uh, she's a crop circle investigator primarily, and now you've gone off in other directions, but I met you, first time I went to the crop circles in, was in 92. And yeah. I think I met you that year or 93, one of them. Yeah, we were it in, was that long ago. We were, isn't that awful to think it was that long ago? Yes. <laughs> we were in the pub by the canal yeah. with all of the other crop circle investigators at the foot of Mel Kill. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I remember that. And it was a long time ago. Got a memory like a hawk, doesn't she? <laughs> <laughs> I have to have a memory. But that's where I first met her, but then our paths have crossed continuously over all these years. And Nancy is different, where the rest of the crop circle investigators are always interested in the pictures, which are important. Nancy has always gone from the scientific angle. And I admire her for that. She's got to know why things work, how they work. So she went in with scientists to examine the grain, examine how it were, how it was affected by the energy right. with the microwaves, all of this. She's always gone into the scientific part to prove or disprove. And it's really caused you a lot of trouble to do all of that and a lot of work and many years of it. Yeah. But she stuck with that. But now her work is taking a sudden change. She's come every year to our UFO conference in Eureka Springs with the latest pictures. But now it's going off in a different direction. You might say. <laughs> but I think it's good because it's trying to show you maybe you can't scientifically prove everything. <laughs> you know what I mean? People, many people don't realize that my first take on the crop circles had nothing to do with science at all. I instantly knew they were, science was not my interest. But I do know that people who are educated, particularly people like my mother and the people I grew up with, would never pay attention to the crop circle phenomenon if we could not scientifically demonstrate why they should. And, there was something and that's why I got involved. Everybody thinks it was because it was my only interest, but that's not true. Mm -hmm. but, <laughs> but that's why she spoke at the UFO conference in April, and she said the, she is coming up with a whole new phenomenon that is blowing people away. Mm -hmm. And you had just returned from Holland, and at the end of the conference she said, I've even got better stuff, but I'm saving it for Dolores Cannon's conference. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and I did. So we were telling them, if you want to see it, you better come here. 
Okay, so I'm going to let Nancy fill you in, but it is fantastic stuff. She's been on my radio twice, my share radio show twice, and I wish I could have seen it then because of the way you were describing it. You've seen things nobody has seen. I have seen a few very strange things. So let's let her <laughs> take it. Take it from Thank here, you, Nancy Dolores. Talbot. Thank okay. you. You know, Dolores really has set an example for me uh, in a number of ways, <laughs> one of which I'm a little embarrassed about. But I tend to bitch and moan and complain about things when I'm not entirely happy. And <laughs> Dolores, as you know, goes all over the world. And she does it constantly. She's older than I am. She has a schedule that would, it, it, I could never keep up with. And she doesn't complain. And I realized just recently that if, in fact, I was called to do this, which I have been and I know it, then it's about time I got over this five-year-old stuff. <laughs> and it's because of her. That's what's done it. We were delayed and all this stuff the other day, and I said, what the heck? I don't care. I mean, we got here. OK, I just wanted to start by very briefly. We have three different sets of slides that we're going to be going through today. And in the first batch, I wasn't sure what, what people would be here. Uh, at Eureka Springs, I have shown an awful lot of the science, but I thought there would be people here this, in this particular event who wouldn't have seen some of that. So I've condensed it, made it very tight. Those of you who have seen it before, it'll go by before you even notice. But I want to make sure that I give you some idea of why maybe you should listen to me when we get to some of the more extreme stuff because it's, it gets very extreme. So the very first little bit will be a little bit about the science, the theoretical ideas that emerged from it, and then right away we're gonna get into Robert, this young man in Holland, uh, who is teaching me so much about what's going on, and who has very much made me think, and you'll see why, that all of these things that we call anomalous phenomena, that we label them as poltergeist activity, or remote viewing, or out-of-body experiences, or ETs, or UFOs, or crop circles, or whatever. They're all happening in this one situation. And it turns out now he's not the only one. This makes me think these things are interconnected. And although you all may already be doing this, many people in the UFO and crop circle field are not thinking about these events as interrelated and trying to figure out how. Personally, I think consciousness probably plays a, a pretty big role. Okay, real quick, who is BLT, or who was it when we started? This is John Burke. Can these lights come down a little bit more? Well, can't these go off? What about this whole panel up here? Your cameras will pick up the slides perfectly, I think. That's off, but I mean, if they can hardly see John, they're never going to see the anomalous ones. Just, just turn that thing off. There you go. That's much better. John Burke was a businessman in New York. He discovered the crop circle phenomenon in the early 90s, just as I did. And just like I did, he had also heard about this guy, Levingood, uh, who is the L in BLT. And Levingood is a biophysicist, lives in Michigan, who had already begun to look at plant samples from England. And John and I both heard about this. I drove up to a Michigan to see Lefty, and the three of us talked for a while and realized that something really was going on. They were finding changes in the plants. And in order to do this in a more rigorous way, we had to really organize a protocol. We had to get field workers from all over the world. We had to get these things sampled in a protocol and then have Levingood do his work. So originally, BLT focused entirely on crop circles. That was our primary interest. And here are just a few of the lovely things. And you can see why you would be inspired to want to look at them. This particular event, by the way, I assumed because there are man-made crop circles, particularly in England. And when this one occurred, all squares and, and rectangles, I was sure if there was ever one that was man-made, it was going to be this one. It had all of the bells and whistles. It was not man-made. It blows my mind, but it was not. 
and another one of the ones that kind of intrigue me. Well, the basic work that we do is down on our hands and knees in the field, examining the plants and then, of course, sampling them. We do measurements, uh, we do a radial sampling in almost all of the circular components, and we take hundreds, if not thousands, of plants from inside these circles, or whatever the formation is made of, and then we also take another, an equal amount, outside. And then all of the work is comparing the two, seeing what the changes are. This is a small set of samples from a formation in England in the bags of the soil samples, and here are some of the actual plant samples. The primary results over these first eight, nine, ten years, and the most uh, consistent results around the world, because we've worked in about 17 different countries now, and this is basically what we find over and over. This is apical, top node elongation. Look at the length of those nodes as compared to the controls. These are normal wheat plants, this is from a crop circle. As much as a 250% increase in node length, and that's the top node, is consistently found in crop circles around the world. Not all of them this extreme, but all of the genuine ones show a statistically significant increase at the 95% level of confidence. Another event which we find all the time are these holes blown out, lowered down the plant stem. They're called expulsion cavities. Normally, they're found in the second node beneath the seed head, and sometimes, in extreme cases, in the third and fourth nodes also. Another finding was the change in seed size. Here are the, the control seeds, and here are the samples. You'll see they're smaller. Again, the controls on the left, the samples here. They have been dehydrated. By and large, they weigh less and they do very interesting things when you germinate them. But physically, they weigh less, clearly are dehydrated, and generally look as if they will not germinate. In fact, when crop circles occur in young crop, this is early in the season in May, <coughs> June, maybe the very early part of July, before that seed is fully formed, if a crop circle occurs then, the seeds are dehydrated, they are smaller and they do not grow normally. These are the samples. These are the controls. And you can clearly see quite a difference there. In fact, in the crop circles that occur early in the season, most of those seeds are not vital. They will not reproduce. So essentially what's happened is those plants have been sterilized. However, in crop circles that occur later in the season, when the seed is fully formed, when the crop circle occurs, and this would be from about mid-July through August and actually October here in the States, what happens then is that we get an increased growth rate. The same seeds, they're dehydrated, they look awful, but they produce a greater growth. And here's another graph that shows that here are the samples growing more rapidly than the controls. Not only do they do that, they produce greater yield, and as you'll see, they do it without light or water for long periods of time. Clearly something very interesting, to farmers anyhow, is going on in this crop circle energy situation. Another basic fact that was discovered was that these changes are, do not occur just in geometric crop circles, the pretty ones. There are also areas of randomly down crop that show the same changes. Now, randomly down crop usually is due to weather. When it's a weather condition, you will not find these changes. But often, in the crop circle situation, this one is nearly forming a circle, and here, you'll see these randomly downed areas. When they're found in a field in conjunction with the geometric event, they show the same changes. In other words, the same energy apparently responsible for the design is in some cases also responsible for a much more randomly downed event. This argues for perhaps a natural phenomenon, although we'll see as we go along. Another basic finding was the discovery of magnetic material in the soils at crop circle sites. And in this particular case, you can see 
the tiny little particles embedded in the wheat stalk itself. This first case, the first time we found this, was after the Perseid meteor shower in southern England, when you have little bits of microscopic iron coming down to Earth all the time because the Perseid shower has broken up over southern England. Uh, what we assumed was that that was, you know, why we found this. But subsequently, we began to find these tiny little 10 to 50 micron diameter uh, magnetic spheres in crop circles consistently. And we found them inside the, the boundaries of the crop circle as opposed to outside in the control areas. Now, <clears throat> what could account for some of these findings in known science. Uh, Levingood's uh, concept was that we were most likely looking at the results of some kind of a plasma discharge. This is a, a solar uh, discharge on the surface of the sun. The upper atmosphere is entirely ionized uh, air molecules, very electrified air. And when plasma spirals and does some other things, it gives off other energies which may account for what we're seeing. This is just a chart showing the solar flare activity and how it fluctuates over time. We've discovered that in many cases, in England at least, the numbers of crop circles fluctuate close to the numbers of sunspots. When you have maximum solar flare activity, you also tend to have the most number of crop circles. Not the, not the degree of complexity or of size, simply more of them. And when the sunspot, sunspot activity slows down, which it does in this 11-year cycle, you get fewer of them. So there may be a connection there to the uh, plasma discharges in the upper atmosphere. A solar, I mean, a, a plasma discharge everybody knows about, a very high energy plasma discharge, is of course a lightning strike. Uh, a more moderate plasma discharge is a sprite. The picture isn't showing terribly clearly, but this is just another discharge in the upper atmosphere. And one that everybody's familiar with are the northern lights. This is a very low atmosphere, I mean a lower energy plasma discharge. What Levingood was saying was, is it possible that there's some other kind of plasma discharge, natural, in the atmosphere, unknown to science, which might be causing these changes in the plants? And the reason he thought that was, when spirals rotate, when they spiral, it's a known fact in the laboratory that they emit microwaves. Well, what do microwaves do? They heat up the moisture inside of an egg, if you stick it in your microwave oven, a potato, anything else. Well, they also can heat up the moisture inside the nodes of the plants. The nodes are where the water is in fact collected. So his thought was, the microwaves from the spiraling plasma are heating up very quickly the moisture inside these plant stems. At the top of the plant, the fibers are very elastic. They stretch very easily. And causing this sort of a stretch as the steam escapes, you see. Farther down the plant stem, oh, another thing that I had to show you, let me go back here. This node length change, this is a massive node length increase here is in some cases, in some of the crop circles that we found, we discovered that that node length change beginning in the center of the circle, and here we are sampling out to the edge, followed basically a law of physics known as the Beer-Lambert principle. This is simply a mathematical formula that describes the absorption of electromagnetic energy by matter, meaning that whatever the effect is you're looking at, in this case the elongated nodes, had to be caused by an electromagnetic energy. So this discovery of this, this is not a particularly tight correlation, but we had many that were. And so this again encouraged Levengood with the idea that we were looking at something to do certainly with plasma. Whether it was a natural plasma discharge or an engineered one, he can't tell from looking at the end product. But it looked like plasmas were involved. Furthermore, these holes, these expulsion cavities, as they occur farther down that plant stem, they also have water in them, but the fibers there are tough. They don't stretch. When the steam builds up, boom, it simply pop, pops a hole into the node. 
So the microwave radiation, which we know spiraling plasmas emit, could in fact cause both of these physical changes. Furthermore, findings like this, this is a hematite bubble, it's only about maybe 30 or 40 microns in diameter, it's tiny, a uh, clear sign that the iron here has been heated, it's a bubble now. And this is from one of the ma magnetic particle findings. We realized that for these particles to be spheres, they had to fall through the atmosphere in a molten state. Just like years ago, uh, shot from shot towers. I mean, this is how we, during the Revolutionary War, we made bullets. We made molten lead and we dropped it off of shot towers. Because what does it do when it falls? It forms a ball. And so here again, the idea that the meteoritic iron filtering through the Earth's atmosphere, particularly after the perceived meteor shower or any other one, if it got caught up in this plasma system, would be heated up by the microwaves and their strong magnetic fields also associated with these plasmas, which would cause the formation of these little balls as they impacted the Earth. We know they're magnetic because you see how they're lined up here? Levengood took a, a magnet and simply pulled it underneath the slide to, to illustrate the fact that these are magnetized. That means they were formed in a magnetic field, which the spiraling plasma would, of course, uh, account for. Nancy? Yeah. Do you know what the magnification of that uh, thing is? I don't have it in my mind, but it's in the report. That probably is, it's certainly, 400 times, maybe? They're tiny. They range, uh, I mean, you can't see them with your eyes, most of them. They range 30, 40 microns in diameter, usually, but as small as 10 and as large as about 50 is what we've seen. In this particular case in Canada, we were looking at the soils sampling from the center out in several different directions. And in this case, look what we found. That's an incredible correlation. This is the center of the circle. And these are the sampling locations heading out. The deposition of those magnetic particles was in perfect linear arrangement. That doesn't happen by accident. That has got to indicate something that is spiraling at a regular rate of speed, dropping this material in that particular crop circle. We also found that in a number of crop circles in the uh, control areas, way outside of the circles themselves, you would find this same very tight deposition of these tiny little particles. Again, indicating a spiraling or rotating delivery system of some kind. How far out? Well, this one is, what is that, 20 feet? Some of them went as, I mean, it depends on how far the people sampled. And sometimes you can't sample as far as you want because the field ends. I mean, you're limited by what, you know, wherever. We found this up to 300 feet away, 350 actually in England. But it does depend on the, it, it seems to depend on the size of the formation itself, the size of the field in which it has occurred, and also the complexity. The more complex they are, frequently the wider this dispersal rate is. In fact, plants can be affected outside standing crop outside the formations in some cases, up to a certain distance. Now, Levengood was capable of, he discovered something else. These plasmas, when they spiral, giving off the microwaves, these strong magnetic fields, are also known in the lab to be associated with very unusual electrical pulses, what Levengood calls ion avalanches. I think all that really means is very strong electrical pulses. At any rate, he built a piece of equipment, very simple, that could do this. And he took perfectly normal seeds, put them in the machine, cranked the thing, and then tried various different periods of time and intensity levels and whatever. Eventually, he was able to replicate exactly what we were finding in the mature crop circle situations where the seeds grew faster and better and did it without light or water. And this is an ad that he and John Burke put together. That, that thing probably ought to be lowered just a little bit, you know? It's, or have I, is it all in there? Oh, wait, never mind, it's all in there. This was an ad they put together because for a long time, they tried to sell this technology 
to the, uh, not Monsanto, they did try Monsanto, but seed growers, because it doesn't affect the environment, it doesn't affect the bugs and the bees and the critters, it doesn't do anything to the plants other than cause them to grow more rapidly, to gr give greater yield, as in this case you can see, a much greater yield, and without water or sunlight for long periods of time, not period, but for long periods of time. These things are called plant stressors. And whenever a crop can tolerate plant stressors, it means that if you have a drought, it doesn't kill your whole crop. You know, if you have an unusually rainy season, it doesn't kill your whole crop. We thought that this was a fabulous discovery from the study of crop circles, and one of probably many that will eventually be made. And the seed industry, people like Monsanto, and we went all over the world with this, were 100% uninterested. There have been dozens of studies replicating this work that we did not do, that other universities have done around the world. They get exactly the same result, somewhere between a 25 and a 35% increase in yield with the same ability to withstand drought and, and uh, lack of sun. And the seed companies don't want it because they can't control it and they don't make money from it. It's terribly sad. This was just to point out that Levin Good's idea that there could be an unknown plasma system may not be as wacky as it sounds because this particular thing called a blue jet was discovered in what, 2003. So there are still unknown atmospheric events and conceivably he is on the right track here. Whether or not it's an atmospheric event, it does look very clearly to be related to a plasma discharge. All right, that's the science part. <clears throat> we published three papers during those years, or eight, nine, ten years, and they're published in peer-reviewed journals, which means they were accepted by other scientists as being acceptable, you know, good science and, and reasonable to publish them. That's the best criteria we have, anybody has, of scientific work being worth looking at. All science is our step, I and mean, we learn and we learn and we learn, and whatever was right yesterday may not be right tomorrow. But if the method is rigorous and the work has been done well, then it is accepted for publication, and we had three papers that were. Uh, then, I think this was 95 or so, I first heard about this guy. This is Robert Vandenbroek from Holland, and I think he's about 18 there. So that must have been... He's 28 now, what does that make it? Yeah. It says 99 on the side. That doesn't mean it's right because I didn't know how to set my camera. <laughs> God, I'm not too good at some of these things. At any rate, this is Robert when I first uh, did meet him. And I was hearing, we had field workers in Amsterdam, and I got a call one day telling me that there was a young man in the Netherlands who had just seen a crop circle form. Now this was very rare, not too many people see crop circles form, and the details involved him encountering balls of light. This tree is of special importance to him in a field not too far from his house, and he had been out on his bicycle uh, pedaling along the dikes and had witnessed these balls of light near this tree. Uh, they had, one had detached itself from the larger hole circled around his body, he had passed out, and when he woke up he was lying in a brand new crop circle. So I thought this was of interest. These are other circles which have happened. Lots and lots of circles started to happen around him. But I didn't pay a whole bunch of attention at that time. We were very heavily into the science. And I didn't know very much about Robert then. But over the years, dozens and dozens and dozens of crop circles have formed in his immediate vicinity. He knows when they're going to happen. He knows where they're going to happen. And he usually knows almost exactly what they're going to look like. But the incident that really got me involved was this. He, uh, one night with his sister, was sitting, this is the door to his bedroom, which is on the second floor, and there's a little balcony, you see here, outside his bedroom. And they had been listening to music, and this huge ball of light had come and approached the balcony, rotating in place, and frightened them. They went running downstairs to get the parents, and when they came back, the ball of light was gone, but they could see that this is a, this is a photomicrograph, I mean, it's taken through a microscope, but there were little burn marks 
on the outside of the eaves and on the outside of the door, and there was this pile of white powder on the floor itself. The person in Amsterdam, the field worker, called me to find out if we could analyze this white powder, which is, of course, one of the things we can do, because actually we've added about 10 more scientists now. And of these people, one is an analytical chemist, another is an x-ray diffraction expert, and so we can do a lot of things that we couldn't have done originally. So the white powder was sent to us. The infrared spectroscopy report clearly identified it as magnesium carbonate. I mean, magne yeah, magnesium carbonate. The EDFs looked like magnesium oxide, but the IR work refines that. Now, magnesium carbonate is not an unusual substance, but the chemical composition of this particular magnesium carbonate is exactly the same one that we use in fire extinguishers. It's used as a fire retardant. We thought that was curious how in the world it could occur on his balcony. He was out in the middle of the boonies, living next to a farm field. No army base, no flares, nothing of this sort anywhere around. We, of course, could not understand that. I went to Amsterdam, I guess this was the first time I was in Amsterdam, it was 97, to do a lecture, and this was maybe the year after all of this had happened. And his parents, and he came to the lecture, and uh, I knew the minute Robert walked in at the back, I don't know how, but I knew instantly that that was Robert. I hadn't seen a picture of him. And after the lecture, they asked if I would come and stay with them for a couple of days because they were very concerned about all of this. The parents really thought maybe Robert was crazy. They wanted as much scientific proof as they could get that he wasn't. And I had a couple of days. It was very unusual. I never have done this before, just gone with somebody I didn't know at all. But I did go. And the first night I was exhausted because it was I had jet lag. But the second night in the house, this is the living room down here. And his parents, we'd all been up for a while talking, but Robert doesn't speak a great deal of English. And he became very tired and had gone upstairs to bed. His parents and I were sitting down here in the uh, living room just chatting, and they were telling me all sorts of things that go on with Robert, things that they had not had time to tell me before. Suddenly the father jumped up and said, there, there, there it is. And what he had seen was a flash of light out here in the garden, kind of like a flash bulb going off. And they had apparently seen this from time to time before and were delighted that it was happening again because they wanted me to see it, you see. So I turned my chair around, I had not seen that, turned the chair around, and all three of us then just looked out these windows. And what happened was the most amazing thing that ever happened to me. I started to feel this tingling that started at my waist, moved up my back, my front, my sides very slowly, getting more and more intense until it got to around my neck. And by then it was very intense and I was getting scared. And I thought to myself, the hell with science, I'm getting out of here. <laughs> which is exactly what I thought. And at exactly that instant, the tingling stopped completely, and this light show started out here in this little teeny area. I mean, there were flashes of light and balls of light and blobs of light, light in sort of, I don't know how to explain it, like potato sacks, boom, coming down and rolling along the patio. I mean, I've never seen like it ever, even, even since then. And I just stood there with my eyes like saucers, I guess. Nobody said a word. It went on a good 15, 20 seconds. And then it stopped. Nobody said anything. And I'm, I'm some maybe two feet inside. And I inched my way a little closer to the windows, you know. And it starts again. This zzz, moves up the body again, gets to my neck. And this time I'm thinking again, okay, that's about all I can handle. And right as soon as I had the thought, it stopped again, and the light started again. Great big balloon, like bluish balls of light, little teeny dense ones, flashes, these blobs that were coming down from all over. And I mean, it was, you, it was like a three-ring circus. You didn't know where to look first. It was everywhere inside this little area. Well, this repeated itself. We're not positive whether it's five times or seven but we're pretty certain it was, we know it was at least five. And there would be a minute or two in between each episode, then the tingling would start again, 
it would get to a point in the neck where it was a little bit too much and I'd start to freak out. It would stop and then the lights would happen. I'm getting there. I'm getting there. The parents hadn't said a word. Not a word. I had gotten right up inside. I was standing right next to this window. I didn't have the guts to go outside. But I was standing right there and looking up because I could see these things coming down. Well, when it was over, I turned around to them, and again, I have no idea how I knew this, but I said, well, that's it, it's over. Absolutely like God talking, you know, it's over. And they looked at me, and I, have, I don't know why I said it, I don't know how I knew it, but it was so. I then took one parent in the kitchen, I think it was his wife, and left Peter, who was the father, who was terrified, <laughs> sitting in the living room, and I spoke to each of them separately just to find out if they had, were seeing and feeling what I was seeing and feeling. Turns out all of us, the tingling, the light, everything, as far as I could tell, we all experienced the same thing. Now, they were positive that this had happened for me, that this was because I was there and that that was the whole reason for it. I, at that time, thought, well, it's very location specific, but I honestly did not think it was for me. I couldn't see why it would be for me. It just happened to be very, in a very tight area. So we let ourselves not have exactly the same opinion and on we went. I started coming to visit the family every year and I go for two or three weeks. Sometimes I go twice if I have the money and I stay with them. Uh, other events occur all the time. It's a nonstop thing. This is an, a piece of, this is poltergeist stuff. This table had been sitting right up there, which it had been for years, on his balcony. He and I were the only people in the house. That's, we, we both stay up all night. We get up very late. He's in bed. I am too, one o'clock in the afternoon. And he'd gotten up a little bit earlier than normal and come down to the kitchen, which is over here. This table was up there when he left. When he got down, it was lying on the patio. He's, he realized it. He didn't hear a thing. He didn't see anything. But he saw that on the ground. So he came running upstairs to get me uh, worried because he didn't know what was going on. I came downstairs too, and sure enough, there's the table, and it's all, you know, here are these little pieces that have fallen off of it. And I didn't know what to do. I took pictures. We looked at it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It came off the balcony. How did it do that? I don't know. We walked back in those doors and onto the living room, and suddenly the stereo came on so loud, the two of us jumped like we'd been shot. I mean, it was scary. Ba wham! And we were nowhere near the stereo, and it wasn't on. So these are the sorts of things that started to go on fairly regularly. One night upstairs, this, I was staying in a room over here that time, and Robert's room is up this way. And Robert brought me uh, some music, uh, some sort of a CD player, because his father and I had a big fight, and the nerves in the house were pretty tense, so he brought me this CD player, put it on in my room, and I walked down a little bit afterwards and noticed that this light was Zap, zap, zip, 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 doing some weird stuff. So I called Robert and I said, Robert, there's something, I think there's a short in the light. Well, it wasn't a short. We tried all kinds of things. Robert tried to, by now he's doing things with his hands. He couldn't affect it. The thing did it on his own. So I went and got his father because the father built the house. He's very meticulous. I thought if there was a short, he would want to know. And he said, well, it couldn't possibly be because all of the circuits are separate. Uh, it was also making my, my TV, my music thing was going the same way. And they're not on the same circuit. There's no way that could be. It, it wasn't a short. So who knows? It was just another one of those things that happened. There were also circles continuing to occur, which Robert would see regularly. Sometimes he would see light balls. Sometimes he would see columns. Sometimes he'd be up in the air watching it. Sometimes he'd be on the ground. This is one where this particular summer, three occurred in this field right out behind his house. And this one, he was, after a big purple light ball, shaped kind of like a football, I gather, came in over the field, became stationary, elongated, discharged some sort of energy down to the crop surface, and he watched as this circle opened up. Uh, within days, there'd been another one that occurred in daytime where he saw a large glowing yellowish sphere simply hovering. No, the second one was a flash of light. It was all to at night and it was a flash of light. The third one, which occurred in daytime, occurred farther back in the field, 
and that was due to this big sphere. And in every case, he watched. Two of these were circles. The third one was a circle with pathways going off like the sun. This is what the interior looks like. And there's his house, so you can see the proximity to that field. In some of these cases, we tested his just like we tested everybody else's. I, we did, didn't do all of them. There were too many. But we did do quite a few. Here are some samples from one of those circles drying in his garage, which they have to before they're shipped. The sorts of changes we find here are the expulsion cavities, massively elongated nodes. Not only did we find these changes, a completely independent scientist, Dr. Elcho Hasselhoff, not of TV fame, but guy's a physicist, who was interested in all these things. He lives in the Netherlands. He devised this method of measuring nodes on the computer because he's more modern than we. And he was, you know, the, this is his work. And he found the same thing. In one of those circles, these are the controls, the control levels, the node length. Now here are three different diameters cut through the circle. And if you'll notice, this is the center. The node lengths decrease evenly on both sides of the diameter but they're all different. I mean, this is another radius. I mean, this is another diameter. You see how different that is from the first? And here's the third diameter. On either side of the center point, the node length is diminishing in a mirror fashion to the other side, but not to the other two diameters. We have no idea what could cause this. We have no explanation at all. It's simply a fact. There have also been uh, a number of burning episodes. Robert's a very healthy guy and doesn't really take medicines, but he has a nervous compulsion when he's having a great deal of angst. He's often, he'll rub his hands. His father got very concerned that he might rub the skin off and took him to a shrink who prescribed a medicine and they went to get it and they put the medicine in uh, the kitchen cabinet actually. And Robert's father was just supposed to watch in the morning to make sure Robert took it. And the next morning, he puts his hand up there to find this box. And in England, or in Europe generally, medicines generally come in little boxes, not in bottles like we have. So this was in a paper you know, box container. And he couldn't find it. And he gets up on a stool, and you'll see. Oops, that's another one. Well, you'll see in some of the others. It was burnt to a crisp. These things were destroyed. Nothing else in the in the cabinet was just the meds. And they called me up and asked me, well, what, gee, what does that mean? And I said, well, gee, I don't know, but my first instinct is don't take the meds. <laughs> you know, it's uh, who knows. Okay, we have another incident of burning. This is a very different one. This is the father's cell phone. And I actually have this in my house because I haven't finished doing the work that has to be done on it. Now, Peter was a bank president. This is a very you know, upstanding, middle-class guy. And this phone, he brought with him from the bank every day when he came home at night, so if there was any problem, people could call him on this particular phone. And he puts it in a particular place in the house, very Germanic, on top of, you hear music, on top of what would be uh, the mail pile. So it's all loose letters and things. And every morning he comes down, he leaves it in the standby position. Every morning he comes down, it's still in the standby position. He puts it in his, in his pocket and off he goes to work. <clears throat> well, for about three weeks, he was coming in the morning and finding it in the off position. And he called me and he said, what does that mean? I was like, I don't know what it means, Peter. So I'm thinking, I've been reading a lot about cell phone usage. And for those of you who use cell phones, I'll talk about that in a minute. But I knew that there was an increasing incidence of brain cancer in people who use cell phones. So that was what occurred to me, and I told Peter that. I said, Peter, I think it might have something to do with these incidences of brain cancer by people who use cell phones all the time. Maybe somebody's telling you not to use it. Well, nobody's had her phone on. What was that? Oh, how sweet. We had music for a while. <laughs> so uh, he, of course, ignored me. No, he's not going to quit using a cell phone. 
Well, then a couple days later he calls and the cell phone's disappeared. It's not where he always leaves it. And the family's very organized, very disciplined. Uh, there's a wife and Robert and two sisters. And he asked, nobody touched it. They searched the house, they tore it apart. And Robert's mother's a very tidy housekeeper. Uh, if it were there, they would have found it. It wasn't there. Then, about two weeks later, it reappeared in a place they had searched. And he called me up, oh, he found it, it you know, it was okay. And he was gonna use it. The very next morning, he called me up and he had come back from, is that a cell phone that's, oh, he likes it, wants to make music. At any rate, he had decided, uh, you know, he was going to use it, went off to work, came back that night, put it in the standby position on top of the mail like he always did. And the very next morning, this is what he found. I mean, it was burnt to a crisp, front and back. And the most interesting thing is that the papers, there was a school report from his daughter. There were, in fact, that had been taken out of the pile, very carefully placed, exactly in line with the edge of a table in the room. Uh, a book of pictures had been removed and placed elsewhere. A photograph of a dog they'd just gotten, whom I knew did not belong in that house and had told them to get rid of had been taken out of one of their albums underneath this pile, and only it was burned. That, that dog's picture was burned, and nothing else in the pile. And yet, look at the state of this. I mean, something hot had to do that. So he asked me again, what does it mean? I said, Peter, for crying out loud. <laughs> I mean, at this point, I wouldn't use a cell phone if you paid me. This is another incidence of the burned meds, just to show you the cabinet. This was when they did not pay attention, did go back to the doctor, did get another prescription. He puts it up there in the same place again. And this time it didn't burn just the meds, it burned the cabinet, as you can see. But the meds were completely destroyed. And this is an incident that happened a couple years after, and I think this was a homeopathic something or other, for a very minor thing, like a cold or something. Now, I mean, again, you see all these boxes. There were perfectly ordinary things in there for the rest of the family. There was only one intended for Robert, and that's the one that's been burned. And there's, this is a glass tabletop. There's no mark on the painted wall surface, no effect on the glass at all, just this. He also, by this time, was seeing clients uh, he had learned that he knows everything, and it is not a joke, he really does. And so people were starting to come to him for readings of various kinds. Some people could not afford to actually get to him where he lives, and they would send photographs of themselves. And he had a big box next to his desk, and after he had done the work on the photo, he would just throw it into this box. And in that box also, there were some, this is a picture of a crop circle, there were some pictures of me, there were a bunch of others that had fallen on the floor and had ended up in this box. Uh, one day he was looking in the box for something and discovered these burn marks. And in most cases, this is the one of me. This one, I mean, not so bad in the, in the eyes. Most of them, the eyes were gone. But with me, it was all around my heart and then up uh, over my face. And there was one of him and it was little things all around him out in the field. But most of the clients, it was their eyes that were burned. And it was men and women, children, all different complaints, came from all over Holland and Belgium. We could find nothing in common. And it was only some of them, the rest of them weren't touched. He said it wasn't a bad thing. And I hope he's right, because that's really right around my heart. But, I mean, who knows? It's just another one of the things. He and I saw a crop circle form together in 2001. All of this is on the website. These things I'm touching on briefly are on the website in great detail. But we witnessed these tubes of light shooting down from the sky one night, uh, forming a crop circle. This is right out back of his house. Here it is the next morning. I'm looking out. I mean, I'm sitting in my bed. That's how close it was. I had said the night before that I was sick and tired of all this. It was too hard to study. Why the hell couldn't it be easier? <laughs> and boom, it goes right there. It could not get any closer to my bed than that place. 
So I think, okay, be very careful what you ask for. This is what that particular crop formation looked like. And this is a close-up of what it looked like inside. It was in string beans. The field was planted in string beans that year. He and I have seen a couple more happen since, but this was the first one. Those tubes of light, we did not see what they came from. They came with enormous force, straight down, lit the whole place up like 10 times daylight, lit my room up like it was coming in, and we saw nothing. I mean, I, I have no idea. By the time we got to the windows and looked up, uh, there was nothing there. Now, Robert has also, upon occasion, seen and photographed UFOs. He generally makes a very clear distinction between the energies that are involved in crop circles and UFOs. That's something separate. Or at least until recently, it was something separate. This is one of the very early things he photographed. In this field uh, was one of the incidents, I think this is maybe the first one. Yeah, he was riding his bicycle here along the dike around dusk one evening, saw a huge UFO, which he described as a UFO this time, with the lights all around the perimeter, slowly lowering itself down over this cornfield. He walked, got off his bike and walked closer, to, he was trying to find out, gets to about here, and he goes unconscious. When he woke up, he was lying inside this brand new crop circle on the edge. Has no idea how he got there, he wasn't hurt and there was no crop circle to begin with. Another incident a couple of years later, uh, he was on this road one night just pedaling along on his bike and saw a huge glowing orb of light again, just a light, he's not talking about a craft, coming toward him from this end of the road. He's completely alone. There are not even any ditches here to hide in. It engulfed him and as it did so, he could feel as he was losing consciousness the bicycle falling away from him underneath. When he woke up, it was right there, 17 kilometers away from his home, lying right next to the highway, lights rushing at him, these noises. He looks down into the field below, and there's a huge crop circle, multi-circled thing down here, over which he saw a rainbow of some sort. He went down into it, and saw a white gleaming something in the middle of the big circle. It turned out to be the white sweater he had had on when he had lost consciousness. Then he saw a, a darker lump that turned out to be his leather jacket. Uh, on this road, it took him some time in the middle of the night. He did eventually find his bicycle. He never did find this camera, a very expensive camera he had had around his neck, which disappeared. So you can see from all these different events that, I mean, here we got what some people would call abduction or whatever you're flying through the air, uh, remote viewing, out-of-body experiences, polar guy stuff. I mean, all this stuff. This is the night after that crop circle when he was picked up. I was in Poland and I arrived that day and we went into the field, which the farmer had cut that day, and I got a whole bunch of strange photographs. And this is just, they're just a couple of the ones that I got of Robert in that field. These are on film, not digital. I wanted to finish this section with uh, one of the ETs. He has hundreds, maybe thousands now. I, hundreds is probably safer. I think overall the photographs which his father has meticulously kept and cataloged with dates and everything ranges between at least 6,000, and my guess is more between eight and 10,000. And of those, there, I mean, you're gonna see a whole range in the next reel. But in this case, this is back in 2004, he's up at night, because he always is, and he sees this white smoky mist. Now, many, many times he has watched as things emerged out of that mist. This time with his eyes, he watched the whole thing and was able to photograph it periodically. There is something here that is slowly forming. These pictures are not as good as the originals, which I still have to get from his father. They were printed in his book. But you can see a figure starting to emerge. In this one, it starts to fade again. And then here, there's this very bright. And then finally, it was really very clear. Now, he told me about this being that number one, he is very clear this is not the Whitley Strieber ET. 
This is a spiritual being. He is absolutely, he's adamant about that. Uh, I know that it has this long neck, which is not typical. He said that it sat there and he, there was some communication, apparently in the head. He got the message that, that they, he and I guess it's others, uh, are making the crop circles. Robert did not even think to say, do you mean the ones around my house or generally? So we don't know that, but these entities were involved in making crop circles as far as Robert understands. His feeling in its presence was of love. He said it would lean toward him every so often in the chair. And when it did, he could see the wrinkles in its stomach. You know, I mean, I have known Robert for about 14 years now. He's never, ever lied to me, ever. In fact, if anything, he understates what actually I find when I get there. Um, and I'm going to tell you at the end something new that he's telling me lately. I didn't believe this till I saw the pictures. I still have trouble with it. But I'm, a, I'm almost certain that, you know, in fact, he is telling exactly what happened that night. He sat there for 63 minutes while this, whatever this is, solidified and emerged and interacted with him. Yes, sometimes, not in this case. He's had a few events that were so powerful that he was overwhelmed, but much less so now. He's become a lot stronger, as have I. That's the end of that. Let me turn that off. Okay, that's the end of that one. Now, in the next one, all we're going to do is look at is anomalous photos. And this is, I'm trying to give you an overview of the range of unusual photos. I mean, I couldn't possibly show you 8,000 photos. I don't have all of them anyhow. But to give you some idea of this huge range of effects that he has been getting, they be, they're getting more dramatic, uh, more spectacular. Now, I need every light that we can turn off, off. These things, I mean, what we're gonna be doing is looking at this, not me. So anybody who can make this happen, I want, I want people to see this. I brought, I've gone into a lot of trouble to put this together. Spent a lot of money to do it. These slides cost a great deal of money. And I want people to see them. It's these that are the... It's these. This is a very typical. It's the, I just don't want to get into them. The slides are going to move fast, and you just keep, ah, okay. Now you guys are going to see it. They don't need me. All they need is what's on, because these are going to move. Many, many people in the crop circle, you know, thing are getting these. They're, they're all over the place. They call them orbs. This is one of many, many that we see. Many of us also get this smoky stuff. This is the stuff we're talking about, the beings emerging out of. Here we are, this is just recently, and this is a very special case, which I'll tell you about, but again, the smoky stuff. I get it too, this is me taking a picture of Robert, and the smoky stuff is again there. We have many shots of him where it is going into or out of his hands, into or out of his eye. His father doesn't like me to show the ones going into his head, so I don't, but this sort of thing is continual. It's all the time. In the house, outside, it doesn't really matter. This is on one of my visits and I was sick and he was up there in the room with me and again, the white stuff is all over the place. In 2006, we, he and I were present when another crop circle formed right in front of us. The night before it formed, all sorts of strange light phenomena started to occur on uh, the camera. This is, by the way, almost all of these are on my camera with Robert shooting. Uh, because he's been accused of faking things, he uses other people's cameras now almost exclusively. That's actually not in focus very well. Is there a way to... Is that as good as it gets? And then, of course, there are these. Now, I started getting these separate from Robert in France a couple years ago. When I got to Holland, we were both getting them left and right. Uh, these beautiful pinky, orangey things. 
These were right after the crop circle formed and they followed us up out of the field when we walked out of the field back up to the car. I sure can. Can you see him now? Yeah. I, I've got this thing and I'm tethered. Yeah. You. Can you see? Oh. These followed us right up to the car. I got in the car and kept taking pictures and they were right outside the car window. How big they? About basketball sized. Oh. I mean, this, this gives you some you know, overview. Now, one of the things that we've noticed consistently is that when weird photos are gonna get ready to start, you see the color, how it's funny in this picture? This orangey and yellowy kind of stuff happens. And it'll look kind of normal for a while, except for the color, and then other things happen. And I just wanted to illustrate, this is in his kitchen, and you see it just started to go yellow. And then these things start. And look at this. You see the Buddha? That Buddha gets a lot of activity, let me tell you. You see this, the distortion here on this side of the picture? The distortion everywhere else? It's, uh, I mean, there are hundreds and hundreds, and I have hundreds of these, and he's got thousands. And then there are, you know, the many light bulbs. And this happens inside, it happens outside. It doesn't make any difference. When we're outside, we're often in crop circle fields, but not always. Can you go back to that one? Sure. Who's the image in the back? Can we don't know. know I mean? You noticed that too, huh? Yeah. <laughs> don't know. And when you see what's coming up, you'll see Is why we don't know. When you actually took the photos? No. No, didn't see any of this. Now, Robert sometimes does with his own eyes see these things, and I have occasionally, but most of the time, oh no, it is not visible, which is why we now use the digital cameras. Now, this was just at Easter time, and you know, we have hundreds and hundreds of them at Easter, but something else happened at Easter. Now, in this case, this is Mrs. Vandenbroek, this is his father and me. And we're having a little conversation, and you can see the light in the room. In this case, what we see is that the room will go unnaturally dark. It will not be as dark as it's going to look in the next pictures when these light bulbs are around. It's getting a little, that's about the same. But you see this? Nothing's happened as far as lighting goes in the room at all. We haven't done a thing to the lights. Robert's just standing there behind. Now, this I think this was the first night that I was there in August, and I was a little tired because of the you know, jet lag thing. Anyhow, I'm sitting there, and this whole series of lights then start to come right at me and around me. Right there. Um, I know it because I just, I'm, every time I'm there, this stuff happens. But, and look at this. I don't know what this one is. Never seen anything quite like that. I don't feel anything, or this time I didn't. Of course, I was so tired, I might not anyhow. Sometimes I do feel the presence of something. A lot of times I don't. And you're going to see a couple where you'd think I, my head would have been blown off, but I didn't feel anything. But you didn't see them either. No. All right, this one starting to aim. Now, I'm sitting right there. Look what happens. I mean, I'm right there. It's Easter time. Is this maybe appropriate? Again, I'm right there. We got crosses a lot this time. Now we're also getting these things. I don't know, tubes of light both inside and outside. The ones inside have generally been this white. The ones outside, as you'll see in a minute, are green. Here we're just, he's just shooting in different rooms. There's the Buddha again. And there are maybe 15 or 20 going right down to the Buddha's head. And then this in front of the Buddha. This is, the Buddha's right there. And see how dark it is? Nothing has been changed in the room. The lighting is not any different. 
Then he turned to look at the wall. This is a, a pic, that's a Robert's photograph there. It's just the family. And look where the tube of light is going. And this is the one to my head. That's my back. And it's just going right smack to my head. I didn't feel a thing. Well, that's one guy who's looking at these. He says, I'm getting sucked dry. Okay, now we're outside and we're in various fields uh, which had had crop circles and we started to get a whole bunch of these. Now, I'm in, this is his father's jacket. We're in a field, this field actually, there was no crop circle. I was asking, could there please be one in corn? Because I love them when they come in corn. So we're standing at a corn field and I'm just asking for one. But see this? Look at, what is this? And look at it when you do some enhancement. I mean, how does the light just end like that? Here's another one, it's the same place because I got on the same jacket. And look at the enhancement there. You see very strong edges. This edge fine thing helps you identify real things which are actually in front of the camera. Here's another one, I'm standing here. This is in a crop circle field. And notice this. What we're seeing in some of these looks like multiple light balls or, or objects of light going through these tubes. And another one, I'm standing right there. And the guy who's been doing some of these enhancements, he thinks these are tubes that are, his idea was that they were sucking everything out. And I'm thinking, I guess I would feel that. Really? Well, whatever. <clears throat> uh, finally, in the photos, the anomalous photos, in the last year, we've been getting a whole range of new things, which I just think they're beautiful. This crop circle happened at a place called Zevenbergen, and I was particularly struck with it. The area feels very good, and I've gotten a lot more sensitive to how a place feels, I think, and I felt very good here. I also know that this sign, this matters. Robert says that that is a sign of God. I don't know whether it's a sign of God or not, but I know it makes me very happy whenever I see one of those keys. Now this is the actual formation in the field. And here's the F key. This is a little farther away from Robert's house. Oh, and there he and I are going out at night to do our thing. And these are some of the images that we've been getting. We've gotten hundreds of these just in the last year or so. And there it is enhanced again so you can see the edges. And another one. And the enhanced version. All this, you know, we've changed the contrast and put on this edge fine, that's all. Nothing else has been done to the photo. These were all taken with my camera in this case, there were several, a whole batch of these where you could see the horizon in the original just barely. You see here the trees? And then you do the enhancement and you can, I mean, very clear, strong edges looking as if there's something different, a light source perhaps, rushing through that tube. Now this is another camera. This is a German colleague's camera who came one night and had never met Robert. Robert had never seen him before. A uh, brand new camera. The guy has, he sets, we set them all on auto because Robert doesn't know how to make anything happen with fancy cameras. And he simply points and shoots. In this case, this is the moon, which we know is a real object, you know? There it is. And then we have this thing. Well, look at what happens in the enhancement. You're seeing another one from Andreas's camera. I mean, doesn't that look like multiple balls of light whirring around inside? Again, we have the moon, and this is light from a house way in the distance. And again, you see how sharply the moon is outlined? What these sharp edges indicate is that these were real objects in front of the camera, even though we didn't see them at all. We saw none of them, and none of us did. Andreas was there with us. So something very strange is again afoot with the cosmos. 
Now this last one will be uh, the people. Uh, Robert has become a healer as well as a medium. He's well known in Holland now as a medium. He attracts uh, enormous, uh, well, vitriolic, really, uh, behavior from the skeptics. Uh, he's accused of absolutely everything, but it doesn't bother him really at all. It bothers his father terribly. His father is very uh, defensive. And one of the reasons that the skeptics continue to uh, be as vehement as they are is that if they criticize Robert once, the father won't show them anything else. And so they don't get to see the huge amount of information that actually exists. He's learned how to do the Uri Geller stuff and I was there a year ago simply documenting some of this in his office one night when the first uh, person appeared. But I'll show you a few of these. Him just pointing or you know, looking at things and they do all this stuff. He can also make compass, this is pointing north-south as it should, and he can simply aim his hands at it and tell it to come to him or go away from him, and it will do that. Uh, and he doesn't get his hands close to it at all. He's also learned how to uh, stick things to his body, and you know, there are people around the world who can do this. He didn't know that at the time, but there are. And he can take fairly heavy objects and stick them on his body all over. And we were simply documenting this this particular night. Uh, he had told me about how he would see people who had died when some of his clients were there. And he had further told me that he was taking photographs of them, which he would then give to the clients who would say, yes, that's my father or my sister, my mother, my aunt, whatever. I, it's not that I didn't believe him. I just couldn't quite get my head around it, frankly. But this night, it happened for the first time to me. It was right when we were doing this, and we were focused entirely on documenting this. We were not thinking about any of this other stuff. We were, I, we were simply thinking of getting these pictures done. Suddenly, I heard, oops, I'm hitting the wrong button, I'm sorry. Suddenly, I heard very, very quietly a knock on this door. I was standing just inside that door, four or five feet into the little office, and it was a very quiet tap, tap, tap. It was so quiet that although it was clear, I would never have known to pay attention to it if Robert hadn't said, did you hear that? And I knew immediately that something was getting ready to happen, because he never remarks like that. And he came from around his side of the desk and asked me if he could use my camera. And he stood right here in front of this door. I had my head right next to him. There is an LED screen on the back. You can, both of us could see the screen. And he started to take pictures. Now this is all written up on the website right now, but it does not have these photographs because at the time we decided not to put them up. There are quite a few of them, so I'm only gonna show you some. They will go up very shortly in a report we're working on now. But we have no idea who this man is. There are 26 photographs in total, I think 10 of him. Then Robert had the distinct impression that this was someone who had died and needed help getting to somewhere. And so he then called upon the light balls. He says that some of the light balls are uh, entities, spiritual entities here to help people who have died. And those were what he started to call in to help this man. What came first was this. After the man, I think there were 10, maybe 12 shots of the man. Then there is this whatever, and it's there for five or six shots. And then the light balls came, and the whole thing was over. Do you see the color here, how white it is? This is the normal color. The whole sequence, uh, sequence of 26 have that brown sepia tone, when, you know, which is not the real color. So then, now we're down to the most personal part. Uh, I obviously could see that there was a person on the camera. We don't know who it was. Uh, Robert says he thinks it was someone who was dead. I don't know. But last year, my brother died. 
out here. Uh, somewhat unexpectedly. Uh, and, wait a minute. Oh, maybe I put it in later. Maybe I did. Okay, I'll get to it in a sec. I'll, I'm going to show you first some of the other things that Robert has actually photographed. This business started in about 2003, I think. One of the early uh, situations was this guy, uh, a soldier, apparently a world, world War II soldier, who started appearing on Robert's camera. Another shot in another uh, one of the rooms. There are quite a few of these photos, and I just picked a couple of them. The father was intrigued with this and went, took one of the pictures, one of the clear ones, and went next door because a man had moved in there who uh, was an army or something, a retired colonel. Anyhow, he was a military guy. And what Robert's father wanted to know was what war was the soldier from, uh, what country did he represent, and anything else that the guy could tell him. Well, the guy says, well, sure, that's World War II, German. Hold on a minute, I've got a book upstairs and I can tell you the regiment. And he goes upstairs and brings down this book from his house. Now, the man has just moved in. They don't, this family, the Vandenbroeks, don't even know this guy. But he comes down with this book and it opens when he opens it exactly to this page. Now, what you're going to have to look at, do you see the canteen? sticking out behind. It covers a little bit of the leg of the soldier in the middle. And I'll show it to you better. You see this? And see how his leg is covered? Now look at the... It's the same person. From this and other examples, which I'm going to show you, we began to think, okay, are these images, in fact, photographs I mean, Robert had never seen this book. He didn't do anything to make this happen. But is this image the image of a photograph of a person instead of the actual person? Uh, unless you know everybody that you're looking at, this is kind of hard to tell. And you'll see in a little bit, I'm going to show you a couple more. But that is one of our ideas, is that these images, if there is this Akashic field, this Akashic record, perhaps the images somehow come from that place through Robert onto the camera. At any rate, it's quite clear that soldier is the guy in the book. Then we have this gentleman, and he is one of a number of New Guinea mud men. Apparently, there is a ceremony in which these people used to, at least, where these mud masks cover their bodies in mud and do whatever it is they did. And anthropologists had been to New Guinea and had photographed these, uh, a number of these people. But again, this was something completely unknown to Robert. And you have to remember, Robert, at that time, he didn't have a computer. He does have one now. He's had it for about a year. But he doesn't know how to run it. But he didn't even have one back then. So there is no way that this could have been done that way. At any rate, this being started to appear in some 50, 60 pictures over the next couple weeks. Sometimes he's opaque, sometimes he's very translucent. Here's one where you see he's almost, you know, almost invisible. Sometimes he was coming from the, down through the ceiling, sometimes up through the floor, sometimes sideways through the walls. Here he is, you can almost not see his, his image at all. The reason I'm showing you that is to show you it's not a paper something held up in front of the of the camera lens. Here's the picture from Reader's Digest. And look at this guy, this man. And now look at the image from Robert's house. It appears to be the same one. Most unfortunately for Robert, when Robert's father put this image out in the media, the skeptics found the larger one. Robert's father failed to tell them that there were dozens of others. I mean, because it isn't just this man, other things. And so they immediately assumed that Robert, you know, was an internet kid, which he's not, and he'd found this image on the internet, somehow gotten it onto his camera, and then was just pulling a hoax. I interviewed some of Robert's clients the last time I was there, and this woman, uh, a lovely lady who lives in a, uh, not too far from Robert in Hooven, had called Robert because she was building a new house, she and her husband, and whenever she was in the new house, 
she felt something was watching her and she didn't like it. She was pretty uncomfortable. And she asked Robert if he could come, find out what it was and make it go. So he went and right away started to get this image. And here's one where the guy is a little bit clearer. He also uh, felt something else when he was in the house, but didn't mention it at that time to Willen. He went home and a couple days later had an extremely strong vision in which he saw this woman whom he had never met. She had died prior to all of this, but he saw her very clearly in his head and realized that this was Willen's mother and she wanted to come through. So Robert called the lady back and said, your mother wants to come through and went back to the house and did get multiple shots that appear to be that same woman and again in the same clothing and everything as is in that photo. Now Robert hadn't seen the photo. It was one in the family's desk, but it looks like the image is of the photo. Now we get to my brother. It's a, let me have a glass, a little bit of water here. Uh, I wasn't real close to my brother for the last um, oh, 20 years or so. He was an adventurer and spent, was all over the world and did not live here in the States. He lived down on an island in the South Pacific. We had been close as children, of course, but I hadn't really known him uh, very well in the last 15, 20 years. But he died very unexpectedly uh, last summer. And none of us knew that he was even ill until very shortly before he came back to the States to go to Hopkins and there was nothing that could be done. And uh, so in fact, uh, he did die. I had tickets to go to Holland not too long after this, uh, in, in August actually, two months after Bill died. And Robert has never seen my brother, had never uh, seen a photograph of him did not know his name even. It had not come up actually in our conversations. But he told me that before my brother died, I had told him on the phone that Bill was sick and had hoped that there was something Robert could do. And Robert said, no, there was nothing that could be done. But he said that the angels were with him and I didn't have room to put all of these pictures in to show you, but I'm quite sure they were, you know, actually, because I took some photographs where that's what I think is there. But he told me that Bill was going to come when I got there to Holland, that he would appear on the camera. And I, I think he told me to warn me, I think he knew it was going to happen. This is the uh, first image of one night, I was a couple days after I arrived. And there are 50 images right in a row. Some, in some cases he's much closer to the camera, in some he's farther away, in some he's clearer, in some he's foggier. In some, his face is slightly distorted, but it's my brother, very close to the camera there. Again, this is my camera with Robert shooting it. In the beginning, I was standing right with. Now, if you look here, one of the things that I started to notice when I've actually looked at these, the field, if you look at these closely, when Bill is in one half of the thing, the other half will be often completely out of focus. And when you look at it on a big screen on a computer, you can clearly see this, that there's a distortion that will occur in one side and not on the other. Many times this also started to happen. And I mean, almost an ET looking face emerged in some cases. I was uh, somewhat overwhelmed by it in a way, but I noticed this, you see the ear? My brother's ear didn't look like that, he had a normal ear. And I had had an idea when Bill died, I hadn't had time to do this, but he loved the Beach Boys and when we were kids, when we were kids, uh, it was the Beach Boys that I remember uh, with my brother, you know. So I wanted to go, I wanted to get some Beach Boys music. And my brother also loved the ocean. He sailed a great deal. And so I wanted to go to the ocean and play the Beach Boys for him. 
uh, just as soon as I could get there. Well, by the time I got to Holland, I hadn't had time to do it. It was on my mind all the time, but I just hadn't done it. Uh, it turns out I think this ear was, had something to do with all this. At the time, I, did, I noticed it, but didn't really know what to make of it. But you see there, it's very distorted. That's one of the ones that's clearer. I, took, I printed some of these, took them to a wake that was held for him in September, and showed these pictures to his ex-wives and children and all these people and without telling them where they come from. I wanted to make sure I wasn't making it up. And I just asked them who it was, and they all said, Bill. So this was the last one of him on that first day. And again, you know, the ear is still sticking out. Immediately after those shots, I'm sorry? I'm sorry, can you back up just a I can't really get very far oh, away because of this. Slide, oh. There's an overlay of an ET that's like. Yes, I think, I think that's entirely possible. I think so. It's made me wonder if, in fact, when our bodies are no longer here or before our bodies are here, is it possible that we actually are ETs, that that's what we look like? I wouldn't be terribly surprised to find out that that might be so, because there are a number of these. I'm not, I don't have time to show you all of them, but it's not just with Bill. There are a number of others where we have multiple images, and I have a series of Robert where, taken in broad daylight, where he's alive, and in one of them, his face becomes an E.T. face, period. It's Robert, 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 E.T., Robert, Robert. And nothing is, and they're all taken within seconds of each other. So, immediately after those 50 shots of Bill, this man appeared. There were four of him in a row. We have no idea who he is, but he also appeared. And I kind of had the feeling that he might be a friend of my brother's who had died at the same time or was there helping to take care of him. I don't know, I never met him. <clears throat> I did go into town a day or so later. I bought the Beach Boys and we went back to this same field. Now this field had enormous numbers of crop circles. I've just finished a report called Events at Woodenhead. And if you go to the BLT website, which is just bltresearch.com, and click on the update section, you will see you know, the report events at Woodenhead, and it will describe all of the crop circles and bizarre events that went on in this field that summer. Uh, this is later in the summer, and I haven't got time to tell you all of those, but it's on the internet. At any rate, we went back, and as you see, this pink stuff, this started immediately. And I backed in, turned the music on, and Bill came up again instantly. There were not so many images this night, but his ear is normal in all of them. And what I discovered, uh, to my amazement, by now I wasn't standing with Robert, I'm standing at the car with the music here, and Robert was moving around wherever he felt Bill's energy. The last two shots are these, and I enhanced this one because you almost couldn't see it otherwise, but he, the, the background again gets very dark much darker than it really was in the last two times he came. This is enhanced also. I mean, it was pitch black before I did that. Now, it, he never appeared again. I was there for three weeks. Robert and I got totally anomalous photos every single night, but my brother didn't come again. I think the ear was, he knew I wanted to play that music for him. He was telling me, for heaven's sakes, go do it. And once I had done it, he didn't have to stay around any longer. After that second night, we got hundreds of these pink balls of light after Bill quit coming. I mean, just all over the place, green streaks. I mean, a huge array of light phenomena for the rest of that night. Now we're to these children, uh, and this is Easter. I was back again at Easter time only briefly, and every time I go there, something different happens. Well, this time it was children, and what we're going to see for the rest of this are these children in brilliant color, and their faces get clearer and clearer. I was standing next to Robert. He's using my camera again, 
And he told me, I mean, we could see nothing with our eyes. He told me, he kept he said, I kept see, I keep seeing a little man. I keep seeing a little man. And I thought he meant over the last week or months he'd been seeing a little man in his head. That's not what he meant. What he meant was right then he was seeing a little man in his head. I handed him the camera and he took these shots. And immediately said to me, there he is, there he is, there's the little man. I think it's a baby, but who knows. Then we had a whole series of this lady. I don't, I don't know. And there's a, a, just a close-up. I cropped it so you could see her face a little better. Then we found, then this charming gentleman appeared. I know, different, you don't know what country, you don't know even what time period. Yeah, he's levitating, I think, as was the baby in the beginning. As was the woman, all that day, that on his camera, my camera, and he was using somebody else's, they were all levitating. Here it is in a different room, the same image, now in his office room. And that one is just a close-up so that you can see. And then this was the one with the clearest face, this little girl, and you'll see her face gets very clear. I love the little red, you see the little red flowers? I mean, it's almost like a portrait. And there she is up close. I mean, it's the first time a little girl has ever come. It's always, I mean, we've had angels, Pope John Paul II appeared, a fabulous eagle. I mean, all kinds of amazing things, but this is the first little girl, and I'm very fond of her. Time to stretch, and thank you for coming very much. Now, if you've got questions, I'm happy to do what I can to answer them. So you're saying She's saying that the clothes don't look modern. Oh, go ahead. What is? Did you ever try to cosplay them, perhaps like the little girl? We're starting to do a number. We have some scientists uh, now involved in the Netherlands, okay. and we got all kinds of equipment set up there now that we didn't have before. And Robert and I are starting to do some experiments. Uh, usually, when these people appear. My brother, it was unusual. He was there for quite a long time. And for some reason, you don't feel like it didn't occur to me to talk to him. It just didn't. These others tend to be coming for maybe 10, 7, 15 times. And it can be, it's maybe a very short period of time. And what happens is that Robert feels the energy. Sometimes if it's a client there doing a reading, he'll know what the energy is. He'll say, it's your mother, it's your grandfather, it's whatever. But like on these occasions, that little boy, he jumped like he'd been shot when he took my camera and the little boy appeared. Because he had no idea, he was seeing it in his head, but he had no idea it was actually going to appear on the camera. And sometimes they only last, I mean, you'll take five or 10 shots and usually it's somewhere in that neighborhood and then that image is gone and something else. What? Well, not yet. It's bad. I'll tell you, it's quite a bit just absorbing that they're there. They start talking to us. I don't know what we're gonna do. <laughs> But, but Nancy, what do you think of the clothes? They look old fashioned, don't they? Yeah. From another time era. I, it seems, what I really think is that Robert is a conduit. Over the years, he has developed, he's matured, his abilities have uh, altered, and 
now whatever's coming by comes in. And I don't think he has complete control. He's getting much more control, Dolores. It's, he has been overwhelmed. So, I mean, I have had a couple times where I was like, oh my Lord. You, it takes a while of getting used to, you know. And I see that happening. I see him getting stronger in, there are some things that have happened which are kind of frightening. And he's right there now. It doesn't scare him. It's like you have there's choices that have to get made, decisions that have to get made. But I think it's a, it seems to be a step-by-step a -step thing. You don't just jump into it. And maybe there'll be communication. I mean, right now what Robert and I are doing is, I didn't have to condemn the room to put all this in, but Robert and I, one night he said, okay, you think of an image, anything you want, and I'm gonna try and photograph it. And so I just closed my eyes and I started, to, I tried to pick something I knew I could picture and I pictured one of those rings, because they're beautiful. He rolls off 10 shots, they're the rings. We're sitting in the living room, the rings, I mean, I don't know whether they were there or not. What I know is that that's what I was thinking and that's what came on the camera. Then I did it with him and it worked too. I got what he was thinking of. Yeah, it does. I know, I, no, I don't think so. It's very hard. Robert is not interested in scientific anything particularly, and he just likes to do what he does. And getting him to hold something so I can watch for, I don't think so. It seems to me it doesn't occur until the button is pushed. And then it's there, it's on the chip. Although now what's happening sometimes, and this happened to me years ago, one of the first time ETs appeared on my camera it was one night we're up photographing things and that Buddha, that beautiful Buddha thing, had uh, uh, an image, that, uh, a thing that happened, these beautiful bars of light, red, green, yeah, all sorts of gorgeous colors, different lengths, different widths, stacked up over its head in the picture. I loved it. There were some birds with great big eyes. There were a number, and then there were a lot of ETs. Well, that particular chip, which was brand new, because I put a brand new one in every day, and now I take them out and put them in a safe place every night. The next morning, certain of those images had disappeared. Not all of them, but certain of them. Apparently, I wasn't supposed to have those images yet. Later, I got them. They came back, and not all of them, but you know, other things. But I, I more and more just accept so, you know, I, I'm not in charge of what's going on here. And you just try to document it carefully is, and then tell people what you can. I can hear them. I can hear them. What? She wants it on the tape. I'll repeat the, I'll repeat the question then. Who? Okay, Dale, go ahead. The question here is, why is it happening? And it's like Peter asking me, why did the phone get fried? I don't know. I know. I, I mean, I don't know. And I have a feeling that all of these different disciplines that the people here have and the different ways that you all pursue knowledge in these areas, somehow out of all of this is going to come a synthesis of understanding. But Robert, one thing Robert and I have been saying to each other lately it's very hard to be in the company of many people who are interested in these things because many people have insisted upon labeling them. They have named things. Robert knows we can't name it and I know we can't name it. It's much bigger. And if you name it, you are narrowing it down. And when he and I are together, one of the reasons I know we get along so well is we don't name anything. We don't call any of this stuff anything. It's just stuff that happens. And if you start trying to categorize it and label it, and that's owning it in a way, and believe me, you don't own it. Whatever this is, it's, uh, it's much bigger and much more complex, I think. And I'm no spiritual, I mean, I have no great knowledge in those areas, but every instinct I have tells me that. Go ahead, Dale. Well, I was going to mention, just uh, getting back to the, the crop circles, um, 
several years ago, probably uh, maybe as much as 10 years ago, I don't know if you're familiar with the one video that actually shows an orb. The light bulb? It's circling in the field and actually creating a crop circle that was caught on video. Well, it wasn't creating, it was just there. It yeah. That, that particular video is probably a hoax, but it doesn't, uh, well, unfortunately, the way it was handled, they, no one will ever know, believe me. When Nobody knows, and it's the likelihood of it being a hoax has to be kept in consideration. But Levengood said, when he saw it, that regardless of whether it was a hoax or not, in his opinion, if a plasma source was involved, it would behave as it did in that particular video. So he may not be, I mean, it may be that whatever is the consciousness behind all of this is creating, projecting, or something, I'll get it in a sec, uh, plasma. And using plasma to do, I mean, using Earth's, whatever's on Earth to do things. That this, I mean, this is not impossible. It's like you know, the Catholic Church can tell you that ETs are our brothers, well, you know, and they did this two weeks ago. So. I thought somebody back here wanted to. The Catholic Church, the Vatican just announced that ETs are our brothers. And I'm thinking, well, that's nice. That's very nice to know this. I mean, what they're doing, I think, is trying to prepare people uh, who would perhaps be frightened otherwise, because I think the Vatican knows more than most of us. And maybe they know something's getting ready to happen. I just wanted to ask you if Robert could levitate. If what? If Robert could levitate, because all those people were levitating. Well, funny you should ask. <laughs> I don't, I, I can't say that I've ever seen Robert levitate. I, had, I know he's going to, and I have no idea how I know that, but I do know he's going to. And something he told me that at Easter time, and his father also said it, and again, believe me, he's never lied. His clients are now telling me, telling him, and his father that they see Robert in their homes when he's not there. <laughs> so I guess that covers levitation, huh? Well, or by location. By location. You see, you all name this stuff. And <laughs> <laughs> okay, they have somebody on that side. And Go ahead, in the pink. I just had a comment about your pictures and about the light um, that came. I went to Peru on a sacred trip. In fact, I found the trip um, source on the internet and it was called Sacred, sacred Tours. Anyway, there were 14 of us toured the sacred sites there, um, Machu Picchu and several of those. But there were many pictures taken during that trip where there are great light auras, where there are beams of multicolored lights. I have one of myself standing at the, standing at the edge of the sun temple. Mm -hmm. uh, in Machu Picchu on sunrise of the winter solstice and beams of light coming into my, the base of my skull and you know just every one of us and there were many many pictures of these multiple colored lights that traveled with us. Yeah I think it's happening there on the on the again on the BLT site I was in France a couple of years ago because there's a bunch of stuff going on there and the same thing. If you all look at the website and check out eyewitness reports, I guarantee you it'll, it'll, it'll keep you up at night a little bit. Is there anybody in the, yeah. okay. Um, the question I had, a friend of mine, I talked with her and she said that recently there was a theory that these crop circles are communication from the ETs to the middle of the earth. What do I know about the middle of the earth? I mean, I don't know. I, well, the, the idea that crop circles are specific messages, I think, is highly unlikely, except perhaps in certain circumstances. Now, there are people who look at them from an astrological point of view, and some of those people find alignments and things which appear to be outlining a particular statement. My greater sus suspicion is that in most cases, crop circles are designed and they look differently each from the other because they're intended to appeal to different people on different levels. Now it may be that some of them are designed to, appear to, to appeal to mathematicians or to geometers or to chemists 
or to people with some particular expertise. And so some of them may encode a formula, for instance, that a mathematician would recognize. This has just happened at one, on one in England that has just occurred at Barbary Castle, where a guy who is a mathematician has clearly uh, identified that that particular crop circle encodes pi. Well, if you are a mathematician enough to, realize, to recognize this, then that is significant. If you're not, uh, something else might appeal to you. And I don't know anything about Middle Earth, so I can't comment about that at all. Well, she was talking about it, um, that the, the transmission going through, because at first I thought that it, the designs on top were all that it was? Uh, well, yeah, that that was the communication. And she said no in a recent lecture that she attended that it was the energy going through that that created the crop circle, but it was, um, as you'd call those orbs and everything else, that they actually were going somewhere and, and there was a communication. Robert told me that at Woodenhead, that field where, all, where my brother appeared, that those formations were intended to heal the earth, which might be what you're talking about. He said they were put there to heal the earth. And I know many people in England think that that's what they're all about. I honestly, I just don't know. I think, I think there are wake-up calls like, hey, pay attention. Like, wake up, wake up. Okay. Um, do you think it's possible, since you were able to take a picture of something that was in your mind. Do you think it's possible that all, this, all the pictures you took were from Robert's mind, that Robert is actually doing it? A lot of people have asked that, because oh, people have? suppose that. And in my brother's case, he had never seen my brother. No, but you, did, could that have come from Oh, so from you're your saying he got too. it from my mind? No, well, he took the he picture, right? He would have to right? in that case. Yeah, but he had never seen my brother. He had never seen a photograph of my brother. He didn't even know my brother's name. But what and if, the image of my brother, which in fact he took, does not look like any picture I happen to have ever seen. Okay. So I don't know what that means. Maybe it's an image of my brother's face that I've forgotten. Maybe it's one that was somebody else took and it does exist somewhere, but I've just never seen it. I don't know. Well, maybe that one's separate, too. You know, maybe they're not all interconnected, but I just... And these children, you see, we have no idea who these children are. One of the things, I am going to put this up. I mean, I'm working on it now. As soon as this is, the report's over, I mean, written, I'm going to put it up, and I'm going to ask people if they recognize, do they see pictures of any of these people anywhere? And if so, where and who are they? That's a real good point. I mean, it would be interesting to see, but it appears... I mean, I have only told you just the teeniest little bit of the stuff that comes. Uh, the, the images of these people now, I know he has maybe 2,000 of them, and it's just people. And then you got this whole ET thing, and I mean you got ETs outside, and you got them inside, and you got them in daytime, and you got them at night, and you got them with yellow eyes. In fact, some of them are green. Green. Totally. So you hear these jokes about little green men, don't laugh. I have seen them. They're green. They're as green as the grass. And then you have to wonder why are the people from, you know, history, why aren't they current, you know, too? I mean, it's. Uh, he puzzle. told me, uh, do we have people here that are so rel religious they're going to get offended if they. Okay. Because one of the images that did appear was an earlier pope who came along with a whole series of Newton. And Newton told Robert told Robert that he'd made a mistake, that animals evolved, but humans didn't come that way. Now, Robert wouldn't dare say that publicly, not in a Catholic country. I mean, you know, he wouldn't dare, but that's what he was told. I mean, there are many, many things that happen that he never talks about at all because it's too many people just simply would be it would be too much for them. And what he feels is that this is all coming from a spiritual realm. It, it has to do with love and lovingness and kindness and all that stuff. And that his job is to get as many people as possible to open their minds to this possibility. And it's their job then to take it wherever they take it. 
but it's his job to try to do something that opens up their minds. And I mean, I know how skeptical I was in the beginning, and I'm still very, very, very careful about things. I don't just jump to it because it's my brother. I mean, I'm looking around for mirrors and all kinds of things. I'm wanting, I don't want to be falsely uh, convinced of anything that miraculous. I simply don't like it. I want to know it only if it's real. And I see every sign that Robert, I see nothing that tells me that Robert isn't. He's as normal as anybody in many ways. He eats french fries, he drinks coke, he's getting fat because he doesn't exercise. But his, there's a, a purity, an innocence, a, a thing to him that is just as real. It's a little part of him that didn't get grown up like other men. And that's the part that's leading all of this. And it's getting much stronger. He's 28 now. And I, the other day I was talking to him. On, I told him I was going to come and do this conference. And this one was different. Uh, because the people coming to this conference are interested in these things much more than many of the you know, ones that I do. And he was thrilled. He wants so much for people to know. But he doesn't speak enough English. And so I promised him. I told him I would write the book. And I also told him, and I'm going to do this, if I can ever get him to come across the ocean, the two of us will do it together. And he'll talk as much as he can, and I'll fill in the part that he can't quite get. A little bit. What? What is the website? Uh, his website or mine? Uh, it's, there's nothing. You wouldn't be able to read his anyhow. It's in Dutch. It's uh, bltresearch.com. And I've just started a whole section on Robert. It's not quite finished yet. Most of his stuff right now is in eyewitness reports, but it will eventually all be in the Robert Vandenbroek section. Yes, go ahead. There's a lady on the end here. Let me do it. Let me do it, Dolores. Go ahead. You were going to tell us something that David had recently said that was new. This business about him, his clients seeing him. The question was, what is the latest thing, this unusual thing? And it is simply that he must be, what do you call it, bilocating? That he's being seen physically, being reported as being present in places where he's not by his clients. And many people have told him that. So uh, they have no, no particular reason. Now there's somebody here too? I. I almost decided not to ask because I was thinking, you'll say, how, how do I know? Yeah. I, I was wondering, though, I'm very sensitive to energy, just energy, and watching these and the streams of light and the balls of light, and I'm wondering if that's what I'm feeling when I feel this energy. Get a camera and start taking. Get somebody to start taking pictures. <laughs> but then I figured, when you're feeling that way, maybe you should get somebody to just start taking pictures of you. Yeah, yeah. I, I just, mean, one of the things both Robert and I have talked about this too. It's not. We don't think of this as all that weird. I mean, we don't. It's it is weird, yes, but we don't think of it as unearthly, or like it's got to upset every the whole apple cart. We kind of think that some of this, at least, has always been so. And I can tell you absolutely without any question at all, for many years I produced uh, big outdoor festivals, uh, particularly bluegrass music. And I hired all these bluegrass musicians from down in the mountains. And I got to know many of those people. Some of them now are my best friends. They see Haints all the time. It's no big deal. Carter Stanley died very young of liver cirrhosis because he drank too much. His brother Ralph, who's a banjo player who's still around, buried Carter right on the family's property on a hill, and he sees Carter out there all the time. I was talking to um, Greg Allen, a banjo player friend of mine in Ohio. Uh, Red Allen was his father, if any of you know bluegrass, famous bluegrass singer. Well, when Red's daughter died, young and prematurely from a drug OD in that case. Uh, Greg was at the ceremony and, and Red and Betty, the parents, were up at the casket. And Greg saw the, his sister, his half-sister, go up behind them, put her arms around them and smile. 
It was so unremarkable to Greg that he didn't even mention it. I mean, there are many people who live a much simpler life or a plainer life or a more honest life or something who don't necessarily find many, all of these things like, oh, oh my God, you got to be just frantic about it. It may be that a lot of this is a natural part of our lives that we are, we've gotten too far away from, we don't know too much about anymore. Okay, I was wondering to ask you, you've probably heard of uh, Ted, Ted Serio's work. I have. What do you think, is this similar or not? Because you don't hear about him anymore, it was many years ago, but he took pictures. He would have pictures in his head, right? He put right? the camera on his head. I did that, and it works, by the way. Uh, uh, I asked Robert when he first was doing this how, how he you know, did it, and one, he used that digital camera as a tool, it's very clever, because you can see what you've done right away. And he said he used to put it up to his forehead and take pictures. Mm -hmm. And pretty soon he noticed that he'd get weird stuff. So then he would do it more. Uh -huh. And so I tried it. And darned if it didn't work, he said, put it up to your forehead and just focus. Really focus. And you have to really focus. And you can't give up. You don't stop after once or twice. You might do it 30 or 40 or 50 times until it starts to happen. Mm -hmm. But when it does, you, get, you feel the groove. And then it's like, oh, it's like that. And you do it again. And he used the camera to reinforce that he had these abilities, just like sticking the stuff on his head, the spoons. Uh -huh. yeah. I mean, these are things like you can practice. He well, says they, that lots of people can do this stuff. Well, yeah, yeah, they can, but one of the things about Ted Serio's work, if you see the pictures, uh, they would usually be pictures of buildings or in the cities and things like that. But sometimes the buildings, when they went and found them, would not be exactly the way they look today. It'd be a window boarded up or a door in the wrong place. Hmm. If I was thinking it's similar to this stuff, it would be a building in a city they could recognize, but it would be something different about it. Well, it's coming from his mind, so how could that happen? Maybe we are dealing with something. I weird. mean, Robert, I can't imagine like the Mudmen, the New Guinea Mudmen, he had never seen anything like that. He had no interest in soldiers, he, wasn't, he never could go to school. This started happening with him when he was in third and fourth grades and he couldn't have people around him because like even now if we walk down the street in the village some days he is getting everything from everybody walking by and he, it's too much so we have to go home and this would happen in school and he simply couldn't go so he doesn't have a lot of the he's very intelligent but he doesn't have a lot of the education that you would expect and this range of things that's happening now I don't think I don't think Picasso could come up with it. I mean, maybe he's doing it, but I don't think so. Yeah. I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Oh. Yeah, I, I just was curious. Um, is there any part of the world that seems to get more crop circles than in others? And what is the, the government of the Netherlands' opinion about these, this kind of phenomenon? OK. Um, I guess the largest number are still being reported in southern England. Southern England has a chalk aquifer. When water percolates from the spring down through this chalk, it sets up an electric charge. We've measured this. We know it's greater than normal and it increases over the summer. The su suggestion that we have, the idea, and we can't prove this yet, is that if you have a substrate of chalk or limestone, a porous rock, and therefore you have this increased electrical charge, it could function as an attractor to these plasma systems, you see. Here in the States, most often they're found over limestone deposits, and limestone is the next most porous rock. So it's, there's an awful lot of work still to be done, and it takes money to do it, and it takes scientists with the expertise and the credentials to make it mean anything. So we do what we can do, and we get volunteers, and we go with whatever they can do. Go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry, the last part. What do the Netherlands think of the crop circles? I don't know the government, so I don't know what they think. But in Holland, generally, there are, there's a great deal more regard for mediums and for, for this sort of thing. It, it is, it is, it's a much more tolerant society in many ways. I mean, nobody cares whether you're gay or straight. Nobody really cares a lot about whether you like drugs or not. I mean, it's, there are a whole bunch of things there that are done quite differently, and mediums and people who do readings and, and all are more common and better respected generally. 
So I know that the farmer, this woodenhead farmer, the thing that was funny about it was that he's a farmer in the Hooven area and crop circles have happened on his properties, his farm in the past, and it makes him furious. He hates them. And so it was so funny when in the village next, this is the only year the guy's done this, he rents a field in this Boschenhoft area. Robert didn't know that. And he's putting in his wheat in this new field and damned if every single circle that happened in Boschenhoff happened in that field. <laughs> and when you translate Boschenhoft into English, a very loose translation is Woodenhead. <laughs> Isn't that kind of remarkable? Like somebody's making a comment here, this guy has got a wooden head. Because, oh. I mean, he's had all sorts of examples that would have convinced almost anybody else, but not that farmer. Go ahead. You've, you've got the mic. Okay. Um, an observation, a remembered observation that just popped into my head when you were talking about Robert's innocence because he hasn't had the um, structured education. Definitely not. That most people have. Okay. I was watching Oprah one day. She had Bill Gates on. They had this big deal about saving these, these children who are dropping out of school and how fully one-third of the population of the United States children are not finishing school. When it occurred to me, this is not by accident. This I don't is, know. Maybe it's good. Well, well, that's what I'm saying, that to me, I thought it was purposeful that these children are not being educated totally. I mean, that, you know, they're be. the indigos. They're, they're the yeah, indigos. Yeah, it, it might be. Yeah. Go ahead, there's a woman in the back. Uh, um, I would like to know how many people in this room, um, besides myself and you, Nancy, have had these experiences even without a camera of seeing what you've what, uh, seen. I imagine this room's full of them. I just didn't know I could take pictures of them. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, we are constantly receiving uh, pictures from on our internet, on the email. People are taking pictures of the orbs and the streaks. I know. Not this kind of stuff, but it's It seems that whatever this is, it's getting closer. And the closer. cloudy stuff. They're sending us a lot of pictures of those. I did, I did want to tell you that these pictures of Roberts, I now have three other people, four other people, where the pictures are more extreme than his. I don't mean of people. Nobody else is getting pictures of people who've died, as far as I know. But the light phenomena photos that are being, that I've got now, I just can't believe them. I just can't believe them. I have no idea what it means, if it means anything. Whoops. But <laughs> they're incredible. So something is changing, and it's all over the world. It's not just in one place. Um, and maybe what we're all hoping, which is that you know, some sort of enlightenment thing happens, maybe it's really getting ready to happen. I wasn't joking about this announcement from the Vatican. I don't think the Vatican makes announcements like that for nothing. And I'm figuring they know something I don't, because they, what? They said in one of their, I don't remember what they call it, a particular name for this kind of thing that they put out. But ETs are our brothers. Those are the words. So from, not, from ETs not existing to suddenly they're our brothers tells me that they know something I don't. And my, my guess is that they have some sense that ETs, something that we call ETs, are getting to the point where more people are going to know about it. And they want every good Catholic not to be screaming and yelling down the street. It's sort of what I'm guessing. Okay, we're we're running out of time. I know there's so many questions. I'll, we can. I'll hang out. And yeah, people she's can. gonna hang out, and you'll be here uh, tomorrow. Oh, tomorrow, she'll be here all day tomorrow. Yeah, and we're gonna. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. And thank. What if you could help others 
to find the power to heal themselves, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. When I started teaching my classes, it was in 2002, and I was just doing the past life regressions and contacting the subconscious part. But then as the time went on and we found how powerful this was and what we could do with it, a lot of the students began saying, you know, advanced past life regression doesn't really tell what it's all about. This is so much more than that. We think you should change the name. So it was a few years ago, we decided to change the name to Quantum Healing Hypnosis Technique. And this is the healing technique that we've now been teaching it well, since 2002, that's 12 years. What if you could time travel with them? Visit mythical places or angelic realms, other worlds, other galaxies. Help others to speak to their higher selves. You can. Dolores has taught thousands of people from across the world how to use QHHT and now you can learn her method by going directly to DoloresCannon.com and don't forget to mention the discount code MORETALKS